Thank you to everyone that's uh, supported me in this new role and prayed for me in this new role. You guys have been absolutely wonderful. I really appreciate the prayers, um, especially for this portion because this is the hardest part for me. But I uh, I do appreciate it, and I um, I can definitely feel um, God giving me little little bumps in the road to to help encourage me and um, steer me forward in this. I've had just unsolicited comments from the youth just telling me um, that they appreciate me stepping into the role and doing a good job, so I do appreciate that. And um, it, was, it was a fun summer. It was a good start to get into this, and I'm excited for this year and what it'll bring, and hopefully we'll have some more fun and, and uh, learn a lot. That's the goal. I just I really do want to want to teach what's, what's been imparted on me to the young people and, and hopefully take something good away from it. So, um, lesson for today, um, I titled this A Letter to the Church. We're going to be primarily focusing in a few different scriptures, but mostly in Revelation 2 and 3. Um, these are about uh, letters that were given to seven specific churches, but um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that and what the church is. So, when I was thinking about this, when I was reading through this, something that really was weighing heavy on me was very recently um, my stepmom passed away and uh, I had a lot of people at that funeral that I noticed were not just from their church, from their congregation, but from so many different churches, so many different denominations that came there to support them and um, and be with my family in that time. and. And First Baptist was a big part of that. A lot of uh, wonderful, wonderful letters, and um, some people came to the funeral, and I just, I really got to see this, this uh, big picture of church. That it wasn't just confined to a building. It wasn't just confined to um, where we go on Sunday. That definition, but it was, it was bigger than that. And um, that helped me when I was going through this, kind of put this in perspective a little bit more. You know, if our society today, newspapers, TV, were to define church, when we see it in the news, we're going to see a definition that looks like, like this, a building. A building with a sign out front, um, a place where people go to gather together to have a worship service of some sort. I'm not even sure that uh, it would be defined as a, as a Christian event so much as just a... Um, a gathering together of people that have faith of some sort. Um, and even when you look it up in the dictionary, you'll see it's a place to go to gather together to worship in faith. So thinking about that and thinking about, okay, but what about us? What about us that are here? How do we define it? How do we define church? And what do we think about when we say we're going to church on Sunday or we are... Um, going to go do an activity at the church. You know, this is this is what we would call our church. It's our it's our place where we gather at First Baptist and uh and it's a good place to go. And many good bodies of believers in here coming together sharing their gifts. Um but what would the building be without you guys? What would the building be if this was full of people that didn't believe in Jesus? What would what would this building be? And what would Sunday morning be? So we're going to dive into this a little bit. Not just what we think, but we're going to look deep into how Jesus described what the church is. So like I said, primarily we're going to be in Revelation talking through. Um, he had some good things to say. He called these good works. I know your works. And praises for these churches. But he also had some rebukes, some things that needed to be repented of, some things that were not good representation of the church. But the very first place in your Bible that church is mentioned is in the book of Matthew when Jesus himself gives what I call the definition of church. He gives this definition as he's talking to his disciples and asking them a little backstory. What uh, what do the people, who do the people say that I am? And they give them some various answers there. But then he's keying in on them specifically. He's 
He's fishing for something here with his, with his disciples. In Matthew chapter 16, if you want to turn there in your Bibles, in Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 through 19, this should be a scripture that's very familiar to us. It says, He, Jesus, said to them, But who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, or son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So Jesus uses this word church, this definition church. It's on this rock I will build my church. Don't take that to mean Peter. We're not building the church on Peter. We're building the church on Peter's profession of who Jesus is. Who is he? He is the Christ. The Christ. The only Christ. He is the Son of the living God. He's the only one. And on that rock, on that foundation, Jesus is building his church. So in other words, it's not, it's not a building, it's not the sign out front, it's not where we go on Sunday. Jesus is saying the church is you. You that profess that, that proclaim that, that know that in your hearts, you are the church. So in this sense, it's bigger. It's bigger than our congregation, it's bigger than us. But fast forward some 2,000 years, and here we are today, and I know if you were to Google churches in Spencer, Iowa, it would come up with some 20 hits. Do all of these places meet this description? I don't know. I don't know, but I know here at First Baptist what we proclaim is Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected. And I think as a part of that, that means that we are representing the bigger body. We come together because it's, it's pretty impossible in this life until the Lord returns and sets up His kingdom, but it's pretty impossible for the entire body to come together and worship every Sunday and use our gifts to gather each other. We can impart, we can support each other, we can do mission work, we can finance, we can send people out, but for everyone to gather in this building, you know, that, would, that just wouldn't be physically possible. So we are a we are a church, we are a small group, but we are a part of the bigger church. When we come together, we represent that bigger body. And as I was reading through these passages in Revelation, particularly in Revelation chapter 1, when he talks about who this is going to, Jesus giving this revelation to an angel to then deliver to John, alone on the island of Patmos, and he's telling him, these things. He's giving him a vision. And in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to the seven churches, to Ephesus and Smyrna, and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. So here, Jesus doesn't seem to be talking about church as one big body. He seems to be talking to seven specific locations. And he is. And there is, um, at this time, there were these seven churches did exist in uh, um, what would be modern-day Turkey today. So these churches were there, and these specific things that were written to them did apply to them. They did have these praises. They did have these rebukes as well. These things were specific to these churches, but also... The message at the end of all of these was, hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. There's a bigger message. There's a bigger message than to just these seven. And I also think there's wisdom in taking note that the number seven, numbers have meaning in the Bible. The number seven was used 12 times in the first chapter of Revelation alone. When we think of the number seven, you can think of God, you can think of His perfectness, His completeness, that number that would represent Him. 
talks about the seven spirits. God's spirit, don't think of it as seven separate spirits. Think of it as one spirit, but represented in this number seven, the seven lampstands. Different numbers of seven. These seven churches, we're going to focus on today and think of them as the one church, the church that Christ built, the church. And how do these things apply today? It wouldn't be good wisdom for us to say, okay, the letter that was written to Laodicea, their, their things that they were doing wrong don't apply to the church in Ephesus just because the letter wasn't written to them. No, these things apply communally. They, com they apply to both these individuals, but also to the larger body. To the larger body. Remember that that key definition that we need to sit on is that Jesus Christ is the Christ. He is the Christ. He is the Son of the living God. That, that profession, that understanding is, is deeper than just a head knowledge. It's knowing that who God is, the Creator, the one that has perfect holiness, that Jesus is, He is that representation. When He was here, He has all of God. He is God. And we need to understand that for His church to go out from here, there were things that we need to do to build the church and to move it. And there are things that are going to be distractions and there are things that are going to hold us back. And ultimately, if the outside world looking at these things and seeing these as a representation of the church, it's going to give them pause, give them wonder, well, that's, what is this? This is, this is, uh, doesn't seem like a very Christian thing. This doesn't seem like a very godly thing. And some of these are pretty, pretty harsh as we go through them. Well, my second point here, as we go through these, we're going to start with the good things. Jesus at the beginning of these letters said, I know your works. I know your works. And he goes into detail, giving these, these different churches. So we're going to kind of bounce through some of these scriptures, but these things are, are important for us to note and look at the context in which they're given. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, it says, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. So Jesus is commending this church. He is commending the church to those of us that are hard at work, patient, patiently, working, and that patience is producing endurance. It's producing endurance when us. And we're called in this to test those that come before us, to test those because there are examples out there. There are places out there that call themselves church, and they have those among them that are coming in and they're spreading lies, they're spreading deceit, they're spreading things that are not in God's holy word and that does damage to the church. There are some that we're not all on the same spot in our spiritual walk. So when we allow this, this uh, as the Bible said, those who are evil to come in among us, and we don't test them, we don't understand, and we allow this to come in and, and assimilate among us, there's going to be deception. There's going to be deceit that comes in among that. And Jesus is commending the church those that call themselves apostles and are not, they are testing them. Testing them and making sure that the church knows they are false. And even when the world around them, when everything looks bleak, they are not growing weary. They are standing up for his testimony. In Revelation 2, verse 9, to this next church, it says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich and the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So this church, tribulation and poverty, this doesn't give me a picture of the big grand concert halls with the lights and the sounds and the, the dancing and the, all these big, big 
performances on Sunday mornings. This gives us the picture of tribulation and poverty, a church that's struggling, a place that's enduring a lot of slander and hate from, from those that are trying to, to put their name in the dirt to lead others away from them. Satan himself trying very hard to destroy their, their testimony. There's probably suffering, there's poor among them, but Jesus says through all this you're rich. You're rich. But what would be rich? What defines rich in Jesus' eyes? Those that hold to the testimony. Those that are proclaiming the faith. Those that are going out and even through all this, all these struggles, they are still going out and doing the good work. Giving the good news. And they're storing up for themselves treasures in heaven. Treasures in heaven. Not earthly things. But all these wonderful things that cannot be destroyed, that cannot be taken away, that cannot break down. In Revelation 2.13, on the next one, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Led to this in the last one. Satan is the current ruler of this world. The Bible makes that clear. He has current dominion in this world. And he is not going to be a big fan of us trying to go out and spread the good news of Jesus. Hard at work. Hard at work. Make no mistake of that. Trying to bring down the church. Bring down those that proclaim. Separate us. Keep us isolated. But this church... The church, those that hold fast to my name and don't deny the faith, even when it's tough, even when the persecution is great, even where Satan is hard at work, those that hold fast are commended. This is what Jesus is looking for us to do. Think of all those martyrs out there in the world today that are in a place where being a Christian is just is the last thing anyone in their right mind would want to do because persecution is going to be great. It's going to be heavy. And some of these that are singing praises to the Lord, singing psalms and hymns even in the face of death, a great testimony. Revelation 2.19, I know your works, your love, and faith and service and patient endurance and your latter works exceeded the first. Jesus knows and loves the church that is serving each other, that's using the gifts that they're given, using the things that make us multiple members a part of one body. And when we have these gifts and we come together, it looks like when we're praying for the sick, when we're praying for each other, when we're coming together, making meals for the hungry, adopting the parentless child, taking care of the widows, all these things that the Bible says are, are good things, warm beds for the homeless. These are, these are wonderful things that the church can do, wonderful things when we come together and we use our gifts in love together. These things are not what we're doing to earn our salvation. That's not the goal. We have salvation, and because of that, because of the free gift that Jesus gave us, we're compelled. We're just so, so compelled to use these gifts and love each other earnestly. And the last one that Jesus gave was in Revelation 3.8. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Jesus is always going to be presenting his church with open door opportunities. Always going to be presenting his church with opportunities to make disciples, to bring others in. Even when the church is known to have little power, even when we might not have resources, we might not have the building, we might not have all these things that we have today, even when we don't have these, Jesus is still going to give opportunity. He's still going to use your testimony and 
when we know that, when we trust that, and we stand firm, and we don't deny His name, these things will be commended. These things are going to produce again that endurance in us, that hope in us that Jesus is longing for and looking for. There are churches today in the world that are fully dependent, fully dependent on God for provision every single day, every single day where the uh, where they're going to gather, where they're going to get together, how um, some of these individuals are even going to eat. But they hold fast. They hold fast because they know it's the truth. They know it's the truth. And the only way. And are glad to proclaim it. But at the end of each of these, Jesus gives a rebuke. He gives a rebuke things that need to be repented of. And he makes this statement, if you do not repent of these things, I will snuff out your lampstand. And as I pondered that and thought about that, I thought about the each individual church and how we have a lampstand. We have a, a burning testimony for Christ. But if these things that follow are going to define us and we don't repent of them, and we continue to embrace this worldly opposition in the church, there might be music, there might be sermons, there might be things, but this church will look very much dead. This church will look very much as one that is not representative of the larger body. Or it might all be taken away, whatever that looks like. So as we go through these, just want us all to be thinking about the things that Jesus is commending us for doing good. We focus on those things, but we also need to be aware. We need to be cognizant of the little things in our lives that we're doing and be cognizant of the culture around us because more and more as this culture grows, these things are going to be pushing in, pressing in on the doors of the church to be a part of it. And Revelation 2, verse 4, says, But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. This one is the one that sticks out to me the most because the love you had at first, or some translations give it your first love, this is Jesus. Everybody needs to think of the time when you first understood the gospel and it went from just being up here to in your heart. When you received Christ, there is a tremendous joy that comes from that. There is a tremendous peace that comes from that that gives you such a, such a heart of love, such a heart of love as the very Holy Spirit enters in you in that moment and you go out and you proclaim that love this isn't talking about abandoning that as if your salvation's going away, but to forget that. To turn to anger, judgment, getting so caught up in things that are they're not building each other up. They're not stirring each other up in the faith. But they're pushing each other down. We live in a technology driven world today where it's you don't have to go far on Facebook or Twitter or anywhere to see people just at each other's throats for different things or all sorts of things that I have to ask, I have to wonder, is anybody actually being changed through these through these fights, through these anger, all these different things? Is anyone's heart really being changed? How do we change the heart? How does how does the gospel Pierce, it has to come from the love. We don't change the heart, but our attitude, our actions, our words, our very way we carry ourselves has to be a beacon, has to be a light. And it has to make an impact on people. But if we're so caught up in all these other things and our very character just looks like one of anger, one of, one of hate, we're not emulating that anymore. 
We stop praying for the lost, trying to reach them. We close ourselves off and bolt the doors instead. In Revelation 2, 14 and 15, But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Some backstory on this in the Old Testament. In the time of Moses, when they were out wandering, there was a king, Balak, who he wanted so badly. He's seen how Israel is just moving, moving, unstoppable. And he is afraid and he wants them to be cursed. So he turns to this this uh, very odd character in the Bible, Balaam, this prophet, and he and he asks him, curse the Israelites, curse the Israelites. And Balaam says, I can't do that. The Lord has not given me permission. I cannot do that. But the tragedy that is taught there is let them take themselves out. Let them take themselves out. Teach them, assimilate among them, and they will turn from their God. They will turn to your ways, your practices. And that's exactly what happened to the Israelites. These, this land that they were given, it was told to them to come into the land and remove. Remove those that are there. Not come in and make nice, be a part of, assimilate together. That was not the command. But they did not remove everyone, and because of that, the testimony of God was not wearing off on others. It was their gods, their immorality, their idol worship, all of that that was coming into the Israelite and Unfortunately, that pattern continued on for many years for them. Today, the New Testament still keys on this very concept. Paul writes that we cannot be unequally yoked with sinners. We cannot be unequally yoked because we will take on their habits, their practices, their things. I don't say this to say that we shouldn't be trying to reach. We shouldn't be trying to go out there and show love, but if we say when we come in these doors that to reach Jesus is to believe and confess, but there's no admittance of sin in our life, there's no confession of that sin and understanding that that's keeping us apart from God, and we just say that come as you are, stay as you are, it's okay, everything, everyone, all goes to heaven. That, that idea here is, is, is what happens. Then the church starts practicing in these things with them. The church starts seeing these things, becoming unequally yoked, and starts practicing in these things that keep us apart from God. In Revelation 2.20, this one's similar, but I think a little more specific on uh, leadership. In verse 20 it says, But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice, again, sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. The Bible is very clear in leadership for the church. There are hermeneutics teachings to when there's no reason not to take the Bible literally and at God's word and what he says then take it literally don't take it spiritually don't think he's just giving a, a grand picture that goes any which way and in the books of Timothy Titus and Peter's letters there is clear instruction for the leaders that we bring into the church clear things qualifications that qualify them so when we stray from that and say, well, those applied back then. They don't apply today. They, um, that's not really what he meant by that. And it starts, we start letting our own interpretation, our own thoughts and things in. Then leaders are supposed to uphold this. Uphold this and every word of this to the letter. 
every period, every capitalization, every part of it, uphold it to the letter. So if you say this part doesn't apply, what else doesn't apply? Then what else starts falling away? What else starts becoming a, uh, a little bit more lax and a little bit more until all of a sudden the flock that's supposed to be led is being led astray. In Revelation 3, 1 and 2, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. God gets all the glory. This is the most important thing that we can understand as a church. God gets all the glory. And we might look like, as I said earlier, a church that's got sermons, that has a big production on Sundays, but those things don't equate to God. They don't necessarily equate to God's blessings. This could be very much distractions. Distractions keeping you from doing the work that Christ has sent before us. And I'm not saying we can't come in and, and grow in some of these areas. That's good. But the focus can't be on ourselves, can't be on fame, can't be on uh, increasing the, the money that comes into the church or increasing our, our salaries or whatever it is. These things have to be done because we're worshiping Christ. We're worshiping Him. That's our goal here when we're here on Sunday. Regardless of what the building looks like, the size, the congregation, all these things, all that aside, what's the intent? What's the goal when we're here? We might look alive, but on the inside... If Christ isn't in here with us, we're not. We're not alive. And we need to wake up. And the last one, Revelation 3, 15, it says, I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. Back to my original point. The bricks, the mortar, the fancy sign, all of these things, they don't make us a part of the church. They don't make us a part of Jesus' church that He built. It's us. It's you. It's the faith. That's what makes us a part of it. And that we gather here and that we fill these pews and that we worship. We learn. We teach. We use our gifts. We grow. That's all byproducts of our, of our faith in Christ, our rooted center in Christ. In this passage, we cannot fake the life that Jesus has given. It's damaging. It's very damaging to the church to come in on Sunday and say, I believe, sing the songs, and then as soon as we leave here Monday through Saturday, it's the cussing, the drinking, all these other things that keep us apart from God. But if someone were to see these, that's a beacon also. That's something that teaches people Okay, so being a Christian is making the appearance, but the rest of the week I still get to be me. The Bible tells us we can know those by their fruit. They either have good fruit or they'll have bad fruit. Church is, this is our church. FBC is our church. It's our place where we come on Sundays. It's our place where we have Awana. We have all these good things. But take all that away. Take the building, take the pews, take it all away. Are we still a body that gathers together and worships Jesus? Worships the one true, the one true God that gives us salvation. No other name given under heaven. Do we worship Him? Is it all for Him? Are we enduring hard times? Are we ready for when tribulation and suffering comes in? And do we still have joy in our hearts? One day there are good things, good things that this body is going to be rewarded for when we stand before the Son and He says, well done. There are good things, but there are also many things in this world and as it increases, there's going to be many distractions. Many things that are going to come in and destroy the church and it's going to be harder and harder and harder to live the faith as you read into the rest of the book of Revelation, that testimony that's coming, there's a dark time coming, but up until then there are birth pangs. There are things that are going to get more difficult. The testimony is going to get harder, but in all that, Jesus commends those that hold fast, that endure, 
that have the faith. I have a little illustration here that I got um, about a man named Billy in Somalia that I think will define these good things, but also these struggles well. Somalia is going to be, if you don't know, it is it is probably one of the most dangerous places in the world. Decades of conflict have gutted the country's infrastructure, and Somalia's economy ranks dead last among all the nations. But it isn't a matter of when you will experience a terrorist attack, or it isn't a matter of if you will experience a terrorist attack, but when. Billy, who was born into a religious family in Mogadishu, his father was a tribal and religious leader who had memorized the entire Koran. And just out of curiosity, Billy started studying an English Bible alongside his Koran. After three years of study, he converted to Christianity. He learned a lot from Christian radio broadcasts from the uh, Sekulis and, the, and Kenya. And it was on that radio that he first heard the voice of another Somali who was also a Christian. Billy's family found out about his new faith when he confessed it to them and they threatened him. That was when he first began to understand the words of Paul in 2 Timothy 3.12. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. Six years, six years after Billy's conversion, he met his first Christian Somali. Together, they formed an underground church of Christians. They gathered 14 believers and started this church together. But a year later, the Muslims discovered the growing Christian community and they started their, their persecution in earnest. Twelve of these 14 members were executed in horrible fashion. Only Billy and one other escaped. Billy still had many attempts on his life. And he eventually ended up moving from the country. And from that base that he started outside of the country, he travels in and out of Somalia now, planting and nurturing underground house churches. No longer are they only 14. In this one little city of Mogadishu, the church is quietly growing because of the testimony of these 12 who died for Christ, who held fast to their faith in this small little underground church, and now it's booming. These things are, uh, when I think of when Jesus says to endure trials, tribulation, this church, um, they didn't have the big building, they didn't have the money, they didn't have the fancy, but they still went out and they did the good things. And I think here at First Baptist we are very blessed. We have a great church, we have good things, and we do good things. I am so deeply excited to be a part of this congregation because when I read through these, these uh, admirations that Jesus gives, these, these praises that he gives, I see this stuff. I see this stuff here in the church. And this church specifically. And I've got to be a part of some of that. But I also want to be cognizant too that these things are in here, these rebukes, these things that need to be confessed of, they're in here for a reason, and I think as we grow further in time, these things are going to be, as I said, pressing in further and further, trying to make their way into the body to defeat you from the inside out. Just like they did to Israel. When all these things started assimilating into their culture, and they started letting a little bit more and a little bit more, and all of a sudden God was just in the back burner, they worshipped all these false gods, all these false idols. And then chastisement had to come, rebuke had to come. On our page, our uh, website, there's a, a mission statement on there, a mission statement that really caught my eye. It says, to help the whole world Find and follow Jesus, starting here, starting now. And I thought that was that was pretty good. That is pretty good. Like I said, I love to be a part of a church that's ready to help the whole world find and follow Jesus, to take that testimony that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and go out into the world. But we've got to start here and start now. 
So with that, I'm going to close. Challenge us in the weeks to come that we would stir each other up in the faith. Continue to gather together. Continue to do the good things that we're doing. But that we would read these things and take them earnestly and know that um, in these days there are going to be trials. There are going to be tribulation as has been since the church started. We're no different. When we read the news and it's not looking the most exciting, let's have faith and let's stand firm together and let's continue to do the good work and know that Jesus is going to continue to present us opportunities and we take those when they come. So again, thank you everybody for being here this morning. Thank you for um, supporting the youth, supporting them on this Youth Sunday and the uh, leading us in these songs, the things that they got to do, and those of you that helped out with those things, I greatly appreciate it. That's another wonderful testimony as I read through these that I got to see and be a part of. Um, let's go before the Lord in prayer again to close this. And again, keep, keep the pastor in your thoughts and in your hearts and in your prayers in the weeks to come. He's in good spirits, and that's encouraging to me. Um, but... We want to pray for God's perfect timing. We want to pray for um, healing. We want to pray for him to, to have this surgery and to feel whole and, and strong again and uh, get him back to us. He's our, he's our spiritual leader, and he does a great job of it, so let's continue to pray for him together. Let us pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for the youth, and thank you, Lord, so much for all those that that come before them and take, uh, take an interest and a loving approach in their lives to, to guide them, to nurture them, to teach them all the wonderful things that you have taught us. Lord, when I think about who you are, that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, that is such a powerful, impactful testimony that each of us carries. And Lord, I just pray that if anyone here today does not know that truth, Lord, that you, would, that you would lead them, that you would soften their heart, that you would knock on the door, Lord, that they could answer and let you in. Lord, I just pray for my congregation. Lord, we are, we are a church here at First Baptist that, that loves you, that wants to proclaim your name, that wants to do these good things and be a beacon in our community. Lord, I just pray for encouragement in the weeks to come. And Lord, we lift up our pastor to you. Lord, I just pray you be with Kurt. Help his body to um, come down from the sickness, Lord, that he, can, that he can get this surgery rescheduled. Lord, we just pray for your perfect timing, your strength, your will in their lives. Lord, we thank you that you have uh, brought Kurt to this congregation and that he does such a wonderful job in, in leading us and guiding us. We thank you for him. We thank you for Carolyn and pray for her as well. And the whole family, Lord, we just pray um, that you're giving them peace, Lord, that they can feel your presence in this time. Father, as we go out this week, give us your strength. May your face shine upon us, Lord, in all that we do. We just praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.